Hey everybody, Dan here. Let me tell you about a new app called Poker Chill. So first, before I even tell you about it, just know this, the first five hours of play are totally free. Five free hours of play. Just log in with promo code HOOPBALL, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L. Poker Chill lets you play poker with your friends with built-in video chat. No more computers or second monitors to try to get your poker on. It's a perfect way to hang out remotely on a Friday night with your buds. It's as fun and real as live poker, but it's on your phone. You can play from anywhere. Your couch, a chair, lying on the floor on your stomach. It's high-quality video chat right in the game, and it's easy. Just three taps to set up for beginners. It's got custom controls for more advanced games if that's your thing. It's available on iPhone and iPad right now, web and Android coming soon. That's right around the corner. So get started now. Download the Poker Chill app. Start playing. Remember, first five hours. Five stinking hours. Totally free. Just log in with promo code HOOPBALL, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L. Poker Chill. That's the app. Check it out. You're going to love it. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Play season-long best ball. Fantasy drafts where you only focus on the most fun part of fantasy, drafting your team. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. Underdog handles the rest for you. No waivers, trades, or setting your lineups each week. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100, get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Welcome to the offseason, everybody. Uh, fantasy offseason, at least. Yeah, we finished it. Another NBA season in the books. Whatever the hell that means for all of us. You know, I I get to this point every year. I think I, I talked about this just for a minute on Friday's show. And I start to feel like I'm missing something that I need to be doing with my hands. Like, I, I need to be... Instead of having... 85 things going on at once all of a sudden overnight I have like six things going on at once and you'd think that that would be comforting but it's quite the opposite I'm I'm grasping at stuff so I'm like constantly back and forth to Twitter but nothing's there <laughs> anyway hope you guys are finding a nice way to keep your hands occupied welcome to fantasy NBA today a sports ethos presentation I'm your host Dan Vespers and it is off season time which you guys know we have a pretty similar arc to our offseason here on Fantasy NBA Today. Those of you that have listened through previous offseasons, welcome back. Those of you that are listening to this offseason for the first time, welcome in. Basically, what we do here on this show is first, as soon as the season ends, we go through lessons learned. Because that's the stuff freshest on our mind. It's we can put it down, pen to paper. Here are things we need to make sure we're doing next year. As the season progresses, mistakes, sometimes, not always mistakes. Sometimes it's just, you know, a couple of things that maybe we did right that we want to replicate. But a lot of the time it is a few things that maybe we missed, something that's new in this this very special and super annoying era of uh, COVID and indefinite injuries. All that stuff, we, we pull it into a big pile and we talk about it for the first couple weeks of the off season. So this is called the Lessons Learned segment of the offseason. From this, we typically transition into team-by-team breakdowns. That kind of goes through, I would say generally, like that type of stuff gets us through basically the end of the playoffs. There's a lot. We do about a team a day. And the team-by-team breakdown is a look back at what they did this season and what the offseason likely holds in store. And yes, there are question marks for a lot of teams, so we can't you can't always know exactly what's going to take place with them, but you can get an idea based on what do we, you know, is a team going up? Is a team going down? Who are some of the free agents on that club? Are those free agents likely to end up somewhere else? In which case, is that a, the type of player that maybe we should be looking at 
So that's the second chunk of the off season. Third chunk of the off season is a little bit up in the air. There's, you know, there's a few things we like to touch upon. Sometimes shows pop up, breaking news type shows that pop up. But hopefully, this gets us relatively close to free agency. And after free agency, you kind of re jumble everything. You do a bit of a refresh on some teams. And then you're in the downslope after that. You start looking at where everybody sits. You start thinking about mock drafts. You start uh, discussing strategies for the upcoming year. And all of a sudden, before you know it, you're at the next season of NBA basketball. And that's what we're going to be doing here. So hopefully you guys can join us through the offseason. It's a nice way to do 25 to 35 minutes of basketball chat every day when we're kind of missing the fantasy grind of things. During the playoffs, we're also going to be talking sports betting a bit during the playoffs. We'll get into that uh, a little bit here on today's show, although not not extensively. The play-in games are tomorrow and Wednesday, and then they could trickle on beyond that, depending on how the different games go. The playoffs actually start on Saturday of this week. So play-in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I believe. Is there, would there be one on Friday? I don't, maybe they would. There might be one on Friday as well. I, I, mean, I haven't dug into that all too clearly here, but uh, we'll talk play in stuff and then we'll talk playoff odds as we get towards the end of the week. We'll look at some of the, the actual series prices and kind of what you're looking at as you, as you handicap the playoffs. So that's what's coming up here on the next little bit. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, although, I, you know, if you didn't listen during the season, I really highly doubt that there are new listeners here for the first day of the off season, but you never know. Fantasy offseason, I guess I should say. Maybe you're in a playoff league. Those are actually kind of fun. My brain needs a break at the end of the regular season, but if you're really bent on doing fantasy basketball right now, uh, it's playoff leagues are, are pretty fun. You basically draft a team, whatever it is, you draft like 10 to 12 players, and there's no pickups, there are no drops. You just start those guys, and it's roto style. So whatever they pile up, so you're constantly balancing whether or not you want a player that's going to go deeper into the playoffs that maybe isn't going to do as much on a per-game basis, or do you want somebody that might flame out quickly in the postseason? You know, we don't know how, how far Denver's going to go. Would you take Nikola Jokic early? He might only get five or six games under his belt if his team gets eliminated. So that's kind of fun. There's a different element, a different set of strategic choices to make in in a playoff league but we're not really going to be talking about that we'll do recaps of the games but really much more from a a sports betting standpoint but as far as today goes your very first lesson learned for this year is one that frankly we probably should have had in seasons past and we've kind of mentioned it in passing and a lot of leagues do it already not all of them but it's time it is time now to make third round reversal mandatory for all fantasy league types. Yeah, you could get away with maybe not doing it in like an eight-teamer, and maybe it's not the end of the world if you don't do it in a 10-teamer, but at 12 and higher, you absolutely positively must have third-round reversal going forward. And today's podcast is going to be about a 15-minute description on why this year it became such a big deal and why previous years... You know, it was already a a medium-sized deal, but we found ways to overcome it. And the funny thing about these lessons learned, or and and this one in particular, a third-round reversal, is that sometimes you need kind of an acute moment to really push the needle far enough for people to make this call. And I really believe pretty strongly that this season was that needle mover. So, you know, I looked back at some previous seasons just to kind of get a uh, a refresher on why maybe we didn't take this plunge in seasons past in some spots and I know many of you have done it already so you're sitting there listening to this podcast like what are you talking about Dan like why why is this something you're only bringing up now in April of 2022 and it's because in previous years while the advantage of having an early pick in the first round was already significant. The third round had become already a bit of a jumble, at least in terms of where the value was lying. And this is kind of the first season where looking back, you can actually see not only 
that the second round, having an early pick in the second round, didn't actually help all that much this year. A little bit, but not that much. The late pick in the third round was a ding also. So, and and again, I realize that by next year, it might not be the same way. Next year, players that go on the turn might not be as far behind as a player that goes fourth or something like that. And maybe next year, the second round is you do have a huge advantage by picking 14th instead of 23rd. Maybe maybe that's uh, a, a wider gap. But this season, the gap between the top of the first round and the end of the first round was as substantial at his, as it has ever been. Nikola Jokic going one overall. And I'm going to look at this by totals, by the way, because I think this is actually fairly relevant. Uh, up until his injury, Steph was right behind him. One and two were actually one and two in fantasy leagues. And Steph was right on pace before he missed the last month of the season. Those guys were going to be one and two. Who went behind them typically? Harden, who, you know, his season wasn't as, as promising. He missed games. He got rest days, things like that. Uh, we always knew it was going to be a little bit screwy, although the Kyrie situation did push him up the board a tad. Luka tended to go early, but we've talked about that many times. But then you get into guys like Carl Anthony Towns, who was number three by totals this year. Friends, life can be a bit exhausting sometimes. You got work, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 hours a week. You've got responsibilities. Got to get your car fixed. Got to take care of the dog. You got kids. Heck, maybe even sometimes you might take a moment for your own hobby. Maybe you play a little golf. Maybe you like going to the gym. Maybe you play tennis. I don't know. Maybe you just play video games and watch TV. But the energy to do all of those, all of uh, that, that ridiculous laundry list can be a bit much sometimes. That's why I take M-Drive Start. M-Drive Start is a premium protein powder packed with seven clinically tested ingredients that support energy, strength, and drive. And six premium protein sources for optimal recovery and digestion. That one, that last one, very important for some. Every year it becomes more obvious that we're getting older. I'm very rickety when I go to bed at night and when I wake up in the morning. But that doesn't necessarily mean we need to slow down. Prioritize the need to take care of your health. So get M Drive Start at mdriveformen.com and use the coupon code HOOPBALL, yes, our old name, H-O-O-P-B-A-L-L for 20% off your first order of M-Drive. You get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Again, get M-Drive started at mdriveformen.com with coupon code HOOPBALL for 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 60-day money-back guarantee. Guys, we are so pumped to introduce some of our new friends, Vincero Collective. If you don't know Vincero yet, they're a premium lifestyle brand out of San Diego carrying watches, sunglasses, and more. Perfect for men or women of any style. Why does Dan, why do I love Vincero? They're modern. They're ethical. With the goal of crafting premium lifestyle accessories for those devoted to growth in any and all aspects of life. Health, wealth, community, whatever. Visit VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall to get a special 15% off and free shipping discount just for our listeners. Again, that's VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall. Vincero spelled V-I-N-C-E-R-O. Their products are stylish. They're of high quality. They're eye-catching. They're modern designs. The watches are stainless steel, durable silicon, and Italian marble straps. For the glasses, all lens are polarized, the frames are handcrafted, and because they know that online shopping can be frustrating, they have a five-year guarantee and a 365-day free return policy. That's nuts, but you don't even need to take my word for it. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews. They've been featured in Forbes, Business Insider, and Newsweek, just to name a few. Go to VinceroCollective.com slash HoopBall, get your 15% off and free shipping offer now. Jason Tatum went eighth in a lot of drafts. Joel Embiid, Kevin Durant was having a monster of a season before he got hurt, played only 55 games and still was inside the first round in totals value. And of course, KD was number two 
by averages this year, and you knew you were getting into a bit of an injury thing with him anyway. But then you get towards the end of the first round. Paul George, Bradley Beal, Jimmy Butler, Anthony Davis. These are the guys that were going near the... Sorry, Giannis actually should have been a little bit higher on the board in terms of where he was going, but we knew he was going to get days off. He was a little bit better this year. He shot 72% at the free throw line, so that did help him uh, stick at the end of the first round. But again, just like Luka, like, unless you were punting, that one was one we can kind of throw out of the way a little bit. Dame was going sort of middle-end first round. He had an injury thing that derailed his season, or it would have been fine also. But here's the thing. Uh... Dame, we'll call Dame kind of a wash in this one because he was going more towards the middle of the first round. But if you're looking at those names that went towards the end of the first round, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, who was probably the best of that bunch, Bradley Beal, Anthony Davis. Where did those guys end up by totals this year? Paul George, 177. Bradley Beal, 203. Jimmy Butler, best of the bunch. 32 by totals because he only played in 57 ball games. Anthony Davis, 93, played in 41 games this year. The guys that went in that neck of the woods, the guys that tended to go between, and I'm going to say the last three picks, basically, Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Giannis, in this one league I'm looking at was Giannis. He went a little later just because of it was Roto, it was a different thing. But typically it was Paul George, Jimmy Butler, Anthony Davis, Bradley Beal, Trey Young typically went in there, so I have to give an example of someone that actually did end up having a really nice fantasy season. Vooch was probably in that neck of the woods also. Bam Adebayo was in that neck of the woods a little bit. And Trey Young was the one guy in that group that that succeeded. He was number four by totals this year. Extraordinarily durable, had a good fantasy season. You roll that together, everything worked out great. But Bam missed a ton of time. Where did he end up? 65 was his final rank, playing in 56 ball games. Vooch was actually fine. He was number 18, but there was no advantage to getting him there. And the reason I bring up Vooch, who actually was okay this year, like a lot of his stuff took a hit, as we figured it would. We said, look, assume there's going to be a small hit in basically everything. His shooting was the thing that was sort of not really rolled into that, not really cooked into that whole thing. Vooch was, aside from Trey Young, of course, who actually was a hit at the end of the first round, beginning of the second round, he was sort of the best case scenario in that group, which was get someone that was slightly behind their actual totals, what the ADP would have suggested their totals value was. But even for Vooch, he was number 29 on a per-game basis. So it's not like he was fantastic per game. He got to where he got because he didn't miss a bunch of time. Terrific. The 10th category we always talk about. But the problem, of course, is that, fine, let's just assume that the guy we got at the end of the first round, whether it was Paul George, Jimmy Butler, or Bradley Beal, those are the three guys that generally went at the end of the first round. Trey was sort of like a right behind them, tended to be the beginning of the second round. But the guys at the end of the first round just weren't close. You were, if you had any of those guys, if you had one of the last three picks, and you ended up with any of those three guys, you were probably, I don't know if I can even say probably, you were definitely going to have a massive uphill climb to get even close to the top of your league. Head-to-head, roto, whatever. Because not having a first-round pick is a brutal blow. A brutal blow. The guys at the top of the first round, Jokic turned out to be Embiid, Cat, Trey Young, Jason Tatum. These are some of the names we've already talked about, and then it's mostly other dudes. These guys carry your team. If you don't have that guy, you need to have such massive hits in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth round to even compete with teams that had Nikola Jokic on their club, for instance. He's a discussion all by himself as to why you need third round reversal. But when I talk about the second round, like let's just all assume every year getting an early pick is a really big deal. This happens basically annually, where if you have a pick in the top two or three, you're going to get a player who more than likely will help carry your team in a way that someone drafting at the end of the first round is not going to. And you're like, oh, but Dan, like, Trey Young outperformed James Harden this year. Yes, that is an example of it. But look, 
even Harden, who I think we can all look at and agree didn't have a good fantasy season, he was still number 15 by totals. So it didn't break your team the way that Bradley Beal and Paul George broke your team, having them at the end of the first round. They broke you. You got nothing effectively out of your first round pick if you ended up with those guys. You got nothing. You'd have been better off rolling uh, some fringe player for the entire season in a head-to-head league. That guy would have more totals value than your first round pick. So the, the disasters at the top were guys that ended up in the 10 to 15 range. The disasters at the bottom were guys that were outside the top 150. That's a huge advantage, and that's a pretty common thing. Not common like it's going to happen a bunch of times every year, but common in that guys at the top, a bad year for a top three pick is probably still going to be someone who helps your team substantially. A bad year for pick 11 or 12 might ruin your team altogether. The only recent example I can think of the other side of that is like when people were taking Kawhi Leonard four or five, about five or six years ago despite the weird injury cloud hanging. That was right before, this is still San Antonio, by the way. I've lost track of how many years that is. This was before rest days were a thing in the NBA, and then it became a thing that year. Actually, our, our, uh, our founder over here, Aaron Bruski, has long since said that having Kawhi Leonard high that season was the single worst prediction he's ever made in his fantasy career. Which I guess, yeah, but how would anybody have known that he was just going to sit the entire season out? So maybe beating yourself up a little bit too much there, Brew. Uh, but here's the thing, and why this season everything has come into such stark focus. The second round, we spent so much time before this season discussing how the end of the second round was this treacherous minefield of disaster. And as it turned out, the only guy who was getting drafted in that, we can call it like the 18 to 24 range, that turned out to be a total disaster was Michael Porter Jr. Because his back went out. And yeah, I mean, we have to just assume that, we'll, we'll call that a, a big miss, because dude had back problems coming out of college. Denver didn't really give us any indication, but that's a giant miss. The other guys that were going, remember all the names we used to kick around at the beginning of this season, right before it, during the draft stretch? And we were like, well, who do you take in that window towards the end of the second round? And I was like, look, just take Rudy Gobert, because that's an easy one. He's generally pretty, pretty healthy for the most part. He missed a little bit of time this year, but he's not going to be too far off his mark. And he was number 23. Who are the other guys that we were talking about in that neck of the woods? Uh, Zach Levine, who was actually not my favorite. You guys might remember I kind of argued against that one a little bit. He was number 40, so not great. Uh, Devin Booker was number 17. He turned out to be solid. LeBron was going in there. Chris Paul. Everything was going fine for Demonis Sabonis. Then he got traded and shut down. So that's a little bit of a weird thing. But Donovan Mitchell had a great season in there. LaMelo Ball had a great season in there. There were more hits in the area we talked about being the really confusing, difficult part of the first three rounds than there were pretty much anywhere else. All those guys, we were like, who do we take here? These guys all feel like we're drafting them at 20, and they all feel like they're going to be in the 25 range on a per-game basis. Well, a lot of them were actually in the 25 range on a per-game basis, but they all were relatively healthy, and so they all exceeded their mark. Chris Paul was better, slightly better than his draft spot. Devin Booker was right around it. LaMelo Ball. Those guys actually ended up 19, 20, 21. Gobert was 22. On a per-game basis. All those guys ended up lined up right there. Donovan Mitchell was 25. They were all right in a row. And then, coming back forward again in the third round, the guys that were going at the front end of the third round, some of them I already mentioned here a moment ago, LeBron was going in the early third, Chris Paul was going in the early to mid-third, Devin Booker was in that group. There, uh, there were some names in there that I never fully understood going early in the third round, like Shea, Gilgis Alexander, who, I mean, yeah, on a per-game basis, he ended up being fine, but we knew he was going to get shut down at some point. So that one was always a really difficult trigger to pull on draft night. Uh, Rashawn Holmes, that sucked. He got shut down effectively by the Kings, had some stuff going on, and there's still more stuff going on. 
that one was unfortunate. But Chris Middleton went in there, and he was a pretty reliable dude once he settled in. Although, you may recall, I said fade a lot of the Bucks early this season, but they came around. Middleton in the early 40s. But as you tick through the third round, the guys that were going towards the middle and end of the third this year, Brandon Ingram, who had a a fairly atrocious season by all accounts. I mean, if we're going to go by totals here, which I think we probably should, he was 121. Christian Wood was going in there. Not on the board. Russell Westbrook, for some reason, people were drafting. He's not even remotely close to on the board. De'Aaron Fox was going towards the end of the third. OG Ananobi was going towards the end of the third, early fourth. Drew Holiday, who actually ended up being one of the better picks in that range. Mikhail Bridges was going there in some drafts. All of this, I mean, Bridges actually went a little later in a lot of drafts. I'm, I'm looking at results from drafts with pretty, pretty good competition here. But the point we're trying to make is, first of all, nothing is all going to fit a narrative like this. Like, sometimes there's going to be a a better pick that goes towards the end of that third round. Actually, Rashawn Holmes, I think, was typically going towards the end of the third round. I may have gotten that one mishmashed a little bit. Uh, DeAndre Ayton was going in the middle of the third. I don't know where you want to classify him in terms of what his value was. He was number 63 by total, so he was fine. Like, that was not a total disaster, but I don't know if he's an early or a late third, based on the numbers I'm looking at right now. He's kind of middle. Point is, early third was the Devin Bookers, the Rudy Gobert's, the uh, Donovan Mitchell's, and late third was... Who the hell did we just talk about late third? Christian Wood, OG Ananobi, who was hurt. Brandon Ingram was late third. Russell Westbrook, late third, early fourth. It actually doesn't even really matter if they're late third or early fourth. Either way, these are guys that have a much lower probability of success than the names we just talked about at the beginning of that round. So this year, in a way that I don't believe any seasons had been, at least in the last five or six since we've been doing this podcast, this is the first time we've seen all three first rounds, first, second, and third round, the first three, favor giving advantages to teams at the back end of the draft. It's the first time. Sometimes you get one or two out of three. And when I say one or two out of three, I basically mean, did the team with an early pick get an advantage in the first round? Yes. Did a team with an early pick get an advantage in the third round? Yes. Did a team with an early pick have a disadvantage in the second round? And this year, the answer was no. So it really all came together. Basically, the one spot where the team with the late pick is supposed to catch up a little bit, which is early pick in the second round, it didn't help this year. And it never helps enough. Getting two picks near the turn never fully covers up for not being able to pick Nikola Jokic first overall in a draft. Nothing that you do gets you close to that mark. Even if you took Trey Young with one of your picks near the turn, you probably ended up with Paul George or something, or AD, you're looking for a pair, as the other. And so, yeah, you didn't get close to Jokic in that instance. And that team that took Jokic probably got someone like LaMelo Ball at the end of the second round. So it didn't cover it. It never fully covers it, but sometimes it gets you closer. In seasons past, Like, if a Kyrie Irving playing a full season or a Jimmy Butler not completely beat up by injuries, you pair those guys together on a turn, that gets you pretty close to, like, a Jokic or a Harden early in the first round and then paired up with, I don't actually remember who went late in the second round last year, but they were fine if unspectacular. And you're like, okay, good. Like, I got Butler, I got uh, Kyrie, and between my two guys, I'm only a little bit behind the the guy with the first overall pick. So, whatever. You know, third round, maybe I'll get a good pick towards the end of the third round, and everything will just be fairly even from this point on. That's your best case scenario. And I know what I'm waxing for so long on a point that is so very simple. 
the simple point, which is what I just said, is having two picks close to one another, late first, early second, is just simply not as valuable over a very long stretch of data as having a super early first round pick and a later second round pick. Those two guys, on average, on the long term, are better than the two guys drafted close together late first, early second. And moreover, this year, for whatever reason, the third round was actually front-loaded as well, probably because of all those late second-round guys we said that actually hit, had a bunch of success, that the, dis- the distance in likelihood of success between the early drafters and the late drafters this year was more substantial than ever. I'm going to do some polls on Twitter today to find out where people drafted and how they did in their leagues. And I know there are going to be some clubs in there that managed to sort of squeak through that, like, had Trey and who the hell else might they have taken a flyer on? Like, Trey and LeBron? Because LeBron wasn't typically going that early, but he was a a fairly public player. And so that was a big win for folks that took him. So if you had, like, Trey and LeBron on the turn... That's your way of maybe sneaking through. And Braun played pretty much until the end of the season. Yeah, he missed a bunch of games in there with different things, but, like, they didn't just shut him down, you know? You had him for most of your... You had him for at least parts of your fantasy playoffs. Trey played every game, and he was going crazy in the fantasy playoffs. But I'm betting, and even as I look at some of my own leagues, just to, like, take a quick gander, especially the Roto League's, those I think are, you know, then you're you're not looking at who got super lucky in the playoffs. Uh, let's see. This team, who won first place in this one? Jokic, one of my Roto Leagues. Let's look at the other Roto League. Who got first place? What, were their, what was their top pick in this draft? I'm going to have to go through. We're doing it on the fly, so we're trying to figure out how it works. Uh, I need draft results. Come on, let's do this quickly here. I don't want to have to hit pause and start the podcast over. Uh, draft results, Cat was the next one. Cat was the next one. Uh, I won the next one we're talking about, and I had Nikola Jokic. <laughs> it's like, it's so obvious. The next one. Who won my other Roto? Nikola Jokic. Three of the four Roto leagues that are that are redraft that I'm in on Yahoo were won by the team with Nikola Jokic. Is that not the craziest damn thing you ever heard? And you're probably wondering, where did the team with Jokic end up in the one where they didn't win? Second place! He pretty much single-handedly won a ton of fantasy leagues this year. So if you need any more evidence than that, and I'll run some polls, and I'm sure we'll get some numbers that are a little bit less lopsided than the ones I'm in, but if you had Jokic in a Roto League, you were, like, basically guaranteed top three right from the outset. You could have just closed your eyes and farted the rest of your lineup out, and you would have been in the top three. Third round reversal is an absolute must. It's the only way that a team like that, that a team like Jokic, well, building your team with Jokic. I mean, the fact that I won this Roto League I was talking about where I had Jokic, I didn't even have a second round pick. I had Michael Porter Jr. He didn't play. But I had Chris Paul early in the third. A Jokic-Chris Paul start? Field goal percent, check. Free throw percent, check. Rebounding, Jokic, yeah, he's got that largely covered. Assists, beyond check. Steals, great. Blocks, not as much. Okay, so I had like two categories I got to sort out going forward. That's pretty damn easy. And I ended up pretty much punting points. I mean, once Michael Porter Jr. was out, there wasn't a whole lot of point in that. But I really, like, look at the draft results. Look at them in your league. And look at what these teams ended up with. The team that had Jokic first in one of them, and I'm just looking at right now, Devin Booker and LaMelo Ball, end of round two, beginning of round three. That's unstoppable. Those are three hits in a row. What about the team at the end of that? Bradley Beal, Jimmy Butler, Brandon Ingram. 12, 13, uh, and 36. That team doesn't have a chance. What if you flipped the third round, though, and that team had Bradley Beal, Jimmy Butler, and LaMelo Ball instead of Brandon Ingram? Are they competitive now? They probably aren't beating a Jokic, Booker, it doesn't matter after that. But they are not going to be wiped out of the league within the first three, four weeks. By the way, that team that had the pick at the end finished ninth. 
So it was never more in focus than it was this season that you need to flip the third round. Predictions are a little bit all over the place, and maybe next year, third round is a little bit more even, but there's no downside to doing it. There's no downside. The teams that have a late first-round pick need an advantage somewhere else in the draft, and this is the way you can try to bring them closer because if you just assume that everybody got the player that they drafted, meaning if you just turn them into numbers, and if you drafted first, you got the first overall player. If you draft 12th, you end up with the 12th overall player in your in totals value. Then adding 12 and 13 together puts you basically right behind Nikola Jokic. But, of course, Jokic, he also adds on the 24th player and the 25th player in your draft, and there's just no catching up from that. But if you put Jokic, if you put 1 and 24 together, just on total value, that gets you to about, and I'm I'm working on Basketball Monsters uh, value column right now, that puts you at about 1.75. KD and Steph, which is 12 and 13, puts you at 1.1. So you're way behind. You're way behind already. And the way you get a little bit closer is by... Time Lord, by the way, was number 25 by totals this year. That would get you about 1.5 after three picks. And the Jokic, so 124 and 36, instead of going from 1.75 to 2.15, it goes from 1.75 to 1.95 or so. So now after three rounds, you're relatively close. You can make up that gap with their next couple of picks in a way that 2.15, which would be 112 or 124 and 25, basically, or 2.1, 12, 13, and 36 gets you to 1.35. Yeah, you're not close. You're now a first, you're now an upper tier first rounder behind after three rounds the way that it worked out this year, and most years, if you just assume that's the player you're getting. So, lesson number one from the 2021-2022 campaign is, starting now, all leagues must implement third-round reversal, and there is no reason not to. Unless you're in an auction draft, that's the one reason not to. I know that's the other thing you guys are yelling at me here. The last 30 minutes, you're like, Dan, just do an auction draft. You know what? I'm in like 10 to 15 leagues. I don't have time for 10 to 15 auction drafts. I have a family. I have to sleep and bathe myself. Those things take forever. I need my drafts to be in and out in like 60, 65 minutes. Unless it's a slow draft with people all over the world. But generally, I need to be in and out in an hour. Set my queue for the last couple of rounds. In and out in an hour. I don't have two to three hours for an auction draft to do that ten times. That's a day. (laughs) I don't have a day. All right, tomorrow, lesson number two. Coming in hot, like flapjacks at this point. Ah, uh, the off season. We rumble along. Again, we'll talk uh, play-in games on tomorrow's show. We'll start uh, getting into playoff stuff a little bit more as this week rumbles along. Have a marvelous Monday, everybody. Enjoy the start of the off season. We ain't going to leave you anytime soon. Five days a week forever here on Fantasy NBA Today. I'm Dan Vespers. Toodaloo. Underdog Fantasy is the fastest-growing fantasy app and easiest place to play fantasy sports. Just jump on underdogfantasy.com or download the app, draft your team, and that's it. And if drafts aren't your thing, they also have a pick'em game where you can win 20 times your money in a single night. Use promo code RADIO, and Underdog will double your first deposit when you sign up with up to $100 in bonus cash. Deposit $100? Get $100 free. That's promo code RADIO. Terms and conditions apply.